When we went to La Chirera, which is the, the epicenter of the Witoto uh, tribe, it's their ancestral home, so that's where we had to go to get this ukule, this orally active varola paste, or so we thought. So we went to La Chirera in search of that, and when we got to La Chirera, uh, you know, we'd been warned by couple anthropologists we've met along the way and so on that you know you just can't march into this village and start asking about Ukuhe they're gonna go completely nuts and they'll probably kill you because it's a big secret you know so I said yeah 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 we know but we're going anyway and, but we'll be careful you know so we got there and when we got to La Chirera, turns out La Chirera is this mission village in the middle of the Amazon that had been cleared for cattle and so you know there were cattle all over the place and that the cow dung of the Cebu cow is the preferred substrate for the Salasvi cubensis mushroom so at this at this place literally there were huge clusters of mushrooms growing up out of every cow pie in the pasture you know and we knew what they were we had books and we knew what they were. You couldn't walk through the pasture without kicking these things over. So we thought, well, this is great. You know, I mean, we were, we were all happy hippies and we thought, well, while we're looking for the real mystery, you know, here's a nice distraction, you know, uh, that we can take and have fun and giggle and all that. And, and so we said, well, fantastic. And, and so we started nibbling on these things and it finally got to a point where we were nibbling on them quite a lot and because actually there wasn't that much to eat you know <laughs> what we were what we were what we had brought with us was, was canned you know tins of meat and rice and things like that and so you know there wasn't a lot to eat and uh, we were actually you know, I mean, we put mushrooms in our soup and in our rice, and we were we were taking them all the time, really. And it led to a, a kind of a state of being, you know, half loaded on psilocybin all the time, and and we were smoking a lot of pot, and we were, you know, a bunch of very sort of verbal people anyway, and so the conversations and the ideas just flowed, you know, and got stranger and stranger and stranger, but in a slow, in a more subtle way. So any external observer would have said, you know, you guys are just completely wacko, but what we were, what we were, the sort of ideas we were kicking around made sense to us in the context of what we understood and, and what came up, you know, in this process of taking these mushrooms all the time and this sort of, you know, speculative milieu of ideas that we were, that we were inhabiting, you know, we hearkened back to what Harner had said years before about ayahuasca and uh, with ayahuasca among the Hivaro, who were called the Shuar now, the Hivaro's actually not a politically correct name, but that's, he worked with them. And, and what they do, they take ayahuasca all the time. And as far as the Shuar are concerned, the ayahuasca dimension is, is reality, and this ordinary dimension is not reality. And uh, they, uh, among other things, what they do is they talk about a fluid, a substance, a material that they can somehow evolve out of their bodies and vomit out. But it's not ordinary vomit. It's some kind of material substance. They look into it and it's like they divine looking into it. They can look into this this biological fluid, whatever it is, and see the future and see things, you know, and that's what they use for divination. So there was that piece of ethnography, and this actually shows up a lot in, in the ayahuasca, you know, cosmology. It's not just the schwar, the mestizo talk about this too, and 
Uh, but so there's that notion that the body is somehow biophysically able to create a substance that's not quite ordinary matter. And we speculated, again, because of our background, and we were pretty well steeped in Jungian psychology and fancied that we knew things about alchemy. And in, in, in terms of what we knew, this notion of uh, a substance that you could produce made perfect sense in terms of alchemy because the alchemists talk about a fluid, the mercury, that you can produce and that, you know, you have to, it's one of the stages toward building the Philosopher's Stone. And one of the stages in alchemy is you have to fix the mercury. You somehow have to nail this thing down so it doesn't evaporate away or so that you can control it and manipulate it. So in our speculations, that became the whole idea that yes, you know, that we, that we came up with this completely I mean, I wouldn't call it a theory. It was more like a, 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 an insight that, yes, these tryptamines enable you to produce this fluid substance, which we understood to have a fourth dimensional aspect to it. And either, I mean, at the time we said, well, what it is, is it's the trip. It's the molecule itself turned through four dimensions and so that the trip is on the outside. And so, you know, in the same sense that a piece of music on a sheet of paper is just, it's nothing until it's played. And when it's expressed through four dimensions in time, then it becomes a piece of music. And so our idea was that, you know, this, that if you could somehow, you know, transdimensionally twist the molecule through its metabolic paces while it was outside of yourself, you could see it. You could actually see the content of the trip. Now, of course, you know, I understand that now that that was a sort of complete misapprehension of what was going on because it attributes far too much importance to the drug and not enough importance to the the, the perceived the, the vessel the instrument in which it's played which is basically your own nervous system in a sense I mean you wouldn't say that the piece of music you know is in the Stradivarius it's not in the Stradivarius until someone comes along and plays it and brings it out of the thing and out of it's it's you understand what I'm saying it comes from within but there was this this tendency to attribute the the qualities of the trip to the drug and not to the person and I think that's a mistake a lot of people still make you know they I mean these things are just compounds you know I mean DMT is a simple chemical compound and it is what it is and it's not much, except that when it's placed in a nervous system, it goes through these metabolic changes and, and the tune is played, as it were. Uh, but our, be that as it may, we had this operating idea that somehow you could actually make this happen outside yourself. And that we, so that became the whole goal of our trying to, uh, Know, create this artifact basically out of using sound and our own nervous system and our own DNA and you know this wild idea that with using sound because one of the things we've noticed on the mushrooms especially and also on DMT but on the mushrooms was that uh, at high doses you could perceive a sound inside your head like a buzzing or a uh, sort of like wind chimes or sort of you know hard to put your finger on but 
that if you listen very closely, you could sing, you could imitate it. And at a certain point, your, and your imitation wasn't that close to what it actually sounded like, but at a certain point, they locked in to each other. And then this sound, which was kind of like a howling and kind of like a buzzing and kind of like a screaming and it kind of, you know, like singing. It was all of these things. I mean, I could make it right here, but I'm not going to. <laughs> because I don't want to disrupt the fabric of space-time. <laughs> but, but it was like that. And it would, it, would, uh, it would elicit, you know, long intervals of hallucination. And, you know, it was just very satisfying that you could modulate sound in this way and get this extended effect. And so we came up with this idea that, well, maybe this we can use sound as the force to to catalyze what was essentially a chemical reaction you know which we speculated that uh, you know if you hit the molecules of a mushroom with the right frequency that you could cause psilocybin to intercalate into the DNA of the mushroom simultaneously with the DNA of our own brains and it would achieve a superconducting state and it would generate a standing waveform which would essentially be the standing wave or a hologram right that's what a standing that's what a hologram is it's a standing waveform that would reflect all of the information in DNA, you know, in a form that you could look at and examine. And, well, again, another, you know, serious sort of serious misperception or misunderstanding of what it's about because DNA doesn't, it has information, but it's not that kind of information. It, it's not the kind of information where you can look into a scope or something and see ideas you know, and that sort of thing. It's, it's chemical information. But we had this idea that a certain vibrational state of DNA, DNA, which could be elicited by this experiment, could generate a sustained standing waveform. And that that would be the way to fix the stone, the way to lock this experience into an external, some kind of an external matrix. And this is really what we were looking for, was something that essentially could, could exteriorize this experience and validate it for not only us, but for anyone. So that, you know, you could point to it and say, yeah, there it is, you know, look at it, here's, here's the, the trip. Well, you know, that was our idea. Um, and of course, it was it was a, it was a crazy idea and had no possibility of being you know realized at all but we had so talked ourselves into uh, we were so totally convinced that we were on the right track and we were so ripped on psilocybin all the time that we actually talked ourselves in we conceived this experiment and utterly believed that it was going to work and so strongly did we believe it was going to work that when all these strange things started to happen in the environment we said well of course this is feed this is a shock wave coming back from the future and what this shows is that you know 8 hours 24 hours up ahead we've succeeded and the fact that things are getting weird proves that we've succeeded up in the future, you know. And so we got ourselves into this like cognitive sort of cul-de-sac where something had to happen. Well, uh, you know, so when we actually performed the experiment, we knew it was going to succeed. And when we made the sound and directed it at the mushroom and all that, what we postulated was going to happen didn't happen, of course, how could it, you know, but something had to happen. And so what happened was 
that we went on this simultaneous trip. Uh, I mean, now we're beyond drugs and into psychosis, <laughs> basically, but where I became, you know, completely spread across the universe. That was my perception that I had taken DMT and I, re I re recollected this, that I, I recollected back to an occasion when I had smoked DMT and had the feeling that I, my ego, my consciousness had been completely spread across the entire space-time continuum. And so uh, that's what I thought had happened. And, and Terence was having this simultaneous uh, complementary psychosis where he became more or less totally focused on the environment and totally focused on me because I think a lot of it was concern that, oh my God, you know, you finally did it. You finally drove your little brother crazy, you know, and it was true. <laughs> and so then he was all, you know, protective and all that. And, and he became very focused on me and on, on getting me back. In the meantime, I'm cruising, you know, uh, all of space time and slowly over days, about two weeks, every 24 hours, I went through a process of reintegration, you know, where every 24 hours I became a little less literally spaced. I mean, it was, it was, and, and because we were working inside this alchemical metaphor and the idea of the stages of this process, and because all of our companions there although they were, you know, probably as loose as we were, but they were out of the loop at this point. I mean, they were just appalled, you know. They basically wanted to call in the airplanes and get us to a mental hospital and get the Thorazine as quickly as possible. But Terence and I, both, we understood each other. We knew what was going on. We could communicate. And Terence was holding them off and saying, no, no, just let this process go. And I'm very grateful to him that he did, because I, I, think, I think that's exactly what needed to happen. It was a re... It was an integration process, which if it had been interrupted, I probably never would have recovered. But because we let it go its natural course, uh, you know, I came back together, more or less. Utterly transformed, not necessarily in a better way, but at least, you know, I can put my shoes on and tie them and stuff like that. And uh, I, uh, but you know, as I look back on that thing and say, what is the model? You know, what really happened? Was it a simultaneous psychosis? You could look at it in those terms or uh, was it, what was it? Was it a, a inadvertent, uh, you know, jamming of the monoamine oxidase system because we were taking, you know, that somehow I jammed the valve open and these tryptamines were not being broken down in the way they should be and so continued to circulate and so on. And on, on the biochemical level, it may have been something like that. But if I look at a model, if I try to justify what happened, I can say, okay, well, we just managed both to go nuts for a couple of weeks. Or I could be a little kinder and say, well, the model of fits that I, that I like to believe now is the model of shamanic initiation. And I say that I, I'm not a shaman and I don't aspire to be a shaman. Uh, and so I'm not coming and saying, you know, I've achieved shamanhood or anything like that. But if you look historically at what shamanism is about, that's very common. The, the, the shaman is, is literally torn apart and spread all over creation and then reconstituted and changed and you know their body is put back together and organs are taken out and crystals are put in their place and you get this idea 
of a, a biophysical transformation uh, in in shamanism, and and that fits. That really fits the model more than a psychosis model or a toxicosis model. I think that's what it was. It was shamanic initiation, and so I'm happy. You know that Terence was able to hold off the the uh, forces of uh, you know modern mental health uh, uh, treatment long enough to allow this process to take place in the middle of the of the jungle. Well, but so I I came back. I came back from that. It really took me a couple of months to really get my feet on the ground. But I came back convinced that we had had tremendous insights into the way that nature was working and the way ecologies, uh, you know, orchestrated themselves through this molecular messenger type thing of which the tryptamines and the beta carbolines were right in there. And so I came back realizing, you know, I have to, s and, and Terry was, Terrence was like, uh, you know, well, uh, this obviates all science. You know, what we're talking about here doesn't fit any scientific model, and we can just dismiss science. And I was like, well, I can't say that because I don't know what science is. If I've learned anything from this experience, I don't know what science is. And so it's a little premature to say, well, let's throw it out. And so I came back convinced that I have to learn how to do science in order to be able to legitimately uh, recognize what its limitations are. And so I came back and changed my major from comparative religions, which was, you know, good enough, but I changed to biochemistry and chemistry and botany and all of these more hard things because I, I really felt this is what I needed to, uh, to study and understand. How does the machinery work, you know? And, uh, and so I went, so anyway, long story short, that I changed.